From Data Rails, this is FPNA Today. Hello, everyone. Welcome to FPNA Today. I am your host, Paul Barnhurst, aka the FPNA Guy, and you are listening to FPNA Today. FPNA Today is brought to you by Data Rails, financial planning and analysis platform for Excel users. Every week, we welcome a leader from the world of financial planning and analysis and discuss some of the biggest stories and challenges in the world of FPNA. We will provide you with actionable advice about financial planning and analysis today. This is going to be your go to resource for all things FPNA. I am thrilled to welcome today's guest on the show, Howard Tuncliffe. Howard, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks, Paul. It's great to be here. Well, we're really excited to have you. And I think I may have said the name wrong, but it's Howard. It's Tunnycliffe, right? That's it. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, sorry. I got it wrong that first time. I knew as soon as I said it. All righty. Now, Howard Hell's from the UK. He has his own online courses around soft skills. He works for The Economist. Interesting enough, he got his degree, if I'm right, majoring in chemistry, right? From the University yeah, right. of Bristol. And he's worked for a number of different companies, including EY, Starbucks, and he spent you know the last almost nine years at the uh, Economist, and he's head of finance for subscription business. Correct? Yeah, that's it. Great. Yeah. So that's a little bit about Howard, and I'll give him a minute to share a little bit more about himself. So why don't I go ahead and introduce yourselves to the audience, Howard? Yeah. Great. Thanks a lot, Paul. So yeah, I think you covered a lot of my my background already. Um, so, so most recently, head of FP8, the Economist, um, in the subscriptions business there, um, and yeah, I've been there for eight, nine years now. So, yeah, clearly it's enjoying it's uh, enjoying it. It's a, a challenging role for me. Um, and then yeah, my side hustle, uh, as you mentioned as well, the soft skills courses. So, I found that um, there aren't always great resources. I think on soft skills, I, I know uh, you yourself, Paul, post a lot of um, technical tips, and, and there's a lot of things on LinkedIn technical wise for finance people. We seem to love that. Um, so my <laughs> my mission is to try and get people more into the soft skills because I think it's really important. Um, and, and in terms of my background, so yeah, as you said, I started off at chemistry, uh, chemistry masters. I realized I wasn't the greatest um, experimental chemist ever. <laughs> so I quite quickly moved on to um, move into accounting while all of my fingers and toes and eyebrows were all intact. Um, and then, yes, yeah, so I've worked uh, a little, little bit in practice. Um, I've worked for yeah, Starbucks and um, a big property company. And, and yeah, it's really just been a nice journey for me in FP&A. You know, that's been, it served me well. I, I think I'm lucky enough to say I'm one of those people that I generally enjoy my job. You know, it's um, not every day is perfect, but I, I find that the natural motivation is there because I'm doing something that I, I really enjoy. No, that, that's great. Like you said, the natural motivation, if that's there, then you're doing well. Not that every day will be perfect, but you're enjoying what you're doing most of the time. That's a win. From accounting to FP&A, what kind of attracted you to FP&A as you made that kind of transition? Sounds like you started with accounting and then moved on to kind of finance and FP&A. Yeah, that, that's right. So I actually took uh, my first steps in accounting were uh, credit control. Um, role. And then uh, that was at Dell Computers. And then I moved into financial accounting and management accounting. So my aim there really was to get the building blocks in place. I think when I was at, at Dell, I really, um, that was my first experience of fp and 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 I was just looking at the fp and team and I thought, wow, what an amazing, they were like the, the rock stars for me. <laughs> you know, I've, I've always been really intrigued by Kind of human psychology and, and then how businesses make their money uh, and actually for me fpna has been a great combination of those two things so you've got the kind of influencing element um, and and the relationship building element but also you've got the really getting into the nuts and bolts of how companies make their money so that was that was kind of calling to me but i spent a little bit of time to get the building blocks in place so i always wanted to say okay i've done my journal posting i've done my management accounts um, and then, yeah, a little tiny spell in practice. Um, and then, yeah, kind of out into the, the commercial side was always what drew me in, I think, really. And then actually in my most recent role, I feel like I've done that commercial side quite um, significantly. So that's been kind of eight or so years. I've, I've worked on purely commercial finance and, and now I've moved into a little bit more of P&L ownership role. So the idea is I can broaden myself out a bit for um, DFD role, which is is my next uh, next aim. 
Well, good. No, yeah, I, I agree with you. It's good to get that broad experience, move around. And that sounds like you very much strategically thought about it. The accounting was to help to give you that foundation to make that next move. And you've done the commercial finance and move on to that FD role. So sounds like, you know, you've thought about it and had a good path there. And I really liked how you mentioned, you know, enjoy, because I find the same as the numbers, right? There's the nuts and bolts of it, but there's the partnering and the influencing. There's the storytelling. There's, you know, what people refer to as the soft skills. I joked about that one time on LinkedIn and told everybody to please stop calling it soft skills. There's nothing soft about it. That got quite a quite a conversation. I think I don't remember if you were on that one, but it generated quite a quite a discussion. So speaking of soft skills, maybe talk a little bit about that because I know that's a real you know emphasis and kind of passion of yours. Yeah. So so my story about soft skills actually is a little bit outside of work. Um, so permit me to just go a little bit off piste for, uh, for a minute or two. Um, so it really happened as a result of a relationship breakup that I had. So I've been in a long-term relationship and um, yeah, it's pretty serious. And we broke up and like a lot of people in that situation, I felt a little bit isolated. So I had to move out of the house we shared. I lost some of the mutual friends that we had and I felt a little bit like starting again. Um, so I actually found um, quite an unusual role as a, a, a guy who's a soft skills coach. So this is more on, on the personal side. And I found on, on Meetup, he was having a session called How to Never Run Out of Things to Say. And I thought, wow, it's 10 pounds. So it's at 15 bucks. Um, and I thought, wow, what a great thing to do. What a, what a great use of my time if I can pick up some tips. Because when do you ever get told how to hold a conversation? When do you ever get told how to never run out of things to say? It's a fascinating subject to me. Um, so I went and had some uh, great time there, um, a guy called Ryan Williams, and then I ended up having some coaching with Ryan, more more about kind of meeting people um, and, and socializing. And then I realized what well, transferred that to work. And actually what I've noticed is I've got more senior at work is that it's the soft skills that really get you promoted. So I think as finance people, most of us have done several qualifications. Most of us were pretty smart at school and that's sort of how we value our intelligence really and that's great you know that it is important that we need that I think you need you need to have like the right level of smarts uh, book smarts um, I think that's important but actually what I found it, in the lower roles uh, sort of earlier on in your career I think it's important mm -hmm. as well and, and being the go-to person for excel can be really helpful you know and and, and actually being able to do tasks more quickly is really beneficial when when you're earlier on in your career because that's really what you're doing you're you're processing tasks and um and the the more accurately and the quicker you can get them done then the, the more value you're going to add to the organization but fairly quickly you know you get into the kind of senior analyst role head of finance a minute that you've got a team you stop really being that individual contributor so you're no longer really or you shouldn't be doing tasks um anywhere near to the level that you you were previously so it's really about harnessing your team, developing your mm -hmm. team, getting the best out of your team. So all the skills like delegation, motivation of other people, you know, making connections across the business are way more important. And, and that's only at my level, kind of uh, head of finance. And what I've noticed, that next step to FD, the step to CFO, most FDs and CFOs are, are very highly skilled in the, the soft skills. And the thing that, I want to try and bring to finance is that I think at the moment it's generally the people that are naturally good at those things that get the promotion. So I think that there's a lot of untapped talent, I think, in finance where people are focusing a bit more on te the technical side, which is great early on in your career. And, you know, you, you need to be good at that. But actually, if you want to unlock your potential in, in the work sense and, and also in your personal life, then it's the soft skills that are really going to help you to do that and they're the things that you need to get promoted and, and, and maybe just one other story which I think highlights that I, I remember in my first role um just a local role at a um software uh, it's actually a, a networking company and I reported directly into the FD because it was a pretty small company and I remember he'd come to me and asked me for excel advice all the time he was a bit of an older guy and um, and his Excel wasn't that great. So I was able to save him loads of time, these Excel tips, and it, it made me feel really useful. I remember thinking, when I get to that level, I'm going to be really good at Excel because he's missing a trick here. You know, he he could be a lot more efficient. 
but actually he had it the right way around. He was focusing on selling. He was focusing on strategy for the business. And then he had me to do Excel tips for him. So actually to get to the FD role, if, if you're really good enough at technical things, don't worry too much. You know, you're, you're good enough. That's going to be good enough. And actually, as you get up, higher up in the pyramid, technical becomes less important and the soft skills become much more important. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. As I've always liked to say, the technical skills get you your first job, soft skills get you promoted. It really is. The further you move up, the more it's about influencing, communicating, partnering, you know, the sales you mentioned, the strategy. You know, and the less it is, it's good to have that solid background and be able to do things when you need to. But the less it is about learning the latest Excel formula, like, do I know how to do X lookup? Do I understand dynamic rates? Yes, those can be fun, but that's the business. That's not what's going to influence the business. Nobody influenced the business by using a different Excel formula than somebody else, right? You know? uh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I think that's true. And it's really about, you need, as a business, you need to keep learning those things. So yeah, it's great that you have people coming in at the, sort of the more junior levels and they, they're they hungry to learn those things as I was hungry to learn Excel, you know, when I learned it. But like you said, for me, I see these fancy functions that come up now and I think, yeah, it's it's not my time to learn those. You know, it's not, my Excel is, is good enough. It doesn't need to be great. And I'd rather focus my time on um, some, yeah, some wider topics. No, and, and that makes a lot of sense. So when you think of soft skills and you think of those, you know, those non-technical skills, sometimes I like to refer to them as, you know, kind of those critical non, non-technical skills versus just soft. What would you say are most important? Like if, if somebody asked you, hey, what are the, two or three things I should most focus on in soft skills? What would those be? Yeah, I think it's a good question. The first one for me that really the cornerstone of everything is listening. And I think that's, it's a very unglamorous skill and and everyone thinks that they can do it. But actually the more that you focus on your listening and work on your listening, you realize that generally people are very bad at listening. You know, there's, there's a lot of, nodding of head and there's a lot of waiting for your turn to speak um, because actually listening is very difficult you know it requires a lot of energy and anything that requires a lot of energy our body's naturally trying to tell us not to do because that we're a kind of a, a primitive beast at heart so I think yeah really thinking about listening and and I'm sort of thinking about my prior self in those earlier roles where you're really getting some good coaching from your uh, manager how many times my manager had to tell me the same thing for it to sink in. You know, I feel quite embarrassed about that. It's probably banging the drum for, for six six months about stakeholder management um, or, or other things I should do. And it took me took me way too long to to improve that area. But thankfully he kept going and mm-hmm. thankfully my listening improved a bit. Um, so listening number one, I'd say a big one at all levels is prioritization. I think particularly through COVID, there's been so much more work, so much more tasks. And we, we sort of lost the human side and we've taken on more tasks. I think for me, I, I try and tell my team at work, well, what's actually going to improve the bottom line? And that should be your priority. You know, and actually, you should be challenging me. If I'm saying, oh, we've got to do this, the regular reporting, and you've got something that's going to really impact on the bottom line, and we're going to make an extra 50K if you do it a week week earlier. Let's focus on that. So just being able to put the busy work to one side and realize probably 1% of your time is responsible for almost all of your impact on the bottom line. So let's try and do more of that for a start. But when we get the opportunity, let's just go full bore and say, you know, one thing that I love about fp a is we're trying to pay back our salaries. You know, we I'm trying to draw the link for my team and say, okay, you should be looking to pay your salary two, three, four, five times over. Um, look for those opportunities. And, and it's possible in, in almost every business, you know, it's possible to do that. Um, so I'd say uh, listening, prioritization is key. And I think also relationship building. Oftentimes you, you only realize your lack of network um, when you when you need it, if you haven't nurtured it. And that might be at work or it might be you get made redundant. It's happening a lot. Um, to, to good people, you know, there, there's no rhyme or reason to, if you're working in the, the travel sector, then you're, that's 
loads of redundancies there and and it's just luck of the draw really whether your business is covid uh, resilient or not um so yeah i think relationship building's really key and that one also has some nice benefits outside of your job as well you know i i feel whenever people leave a job they almost everyone says in their leaving speech it's the people i'm going to miss um but do we spend enough time day to day investing in those relationships versus doing tasks i i don't think that we quite do yeah a no, lot to uh discuss there i i see you had kind of three main points as i heard that there's listening which i 100% agree with it's just critical so important something i've really been trying to focus on especially since i started doing a podcast sometimes i find myself wanting to think of what the next question is and also i'm like wait but i need to recap what they just said i'm like oh i'm not listening so it's 100% true my head's nodding and the other person on the other end is like, oh, yeah, he's listening. But the reality is sometimes I'm not. It, it, and when you said it takes energy, I was just thinking you know, how draining sometimes it can be after doing a podcast just from really trying to focus in. So that's critical. I think that's a great one. And it permeates our whole life. All, all three of those do. Listening, prioritization. I loved how you said, hey, if it's going to get us $50,000, ignore the monthly task and focus on what's going to make money. And I used to run into an issue that happened a few times a year where we'd have a forecast due and I had to finish commissions for our sales team. And I always told my boss, I'm paying our people first. If they don't get paid next Friday, we might lose someone. But if our forecast is a day late, nobody's going to be hurt. Never once did they complain. They always said, yep, you're making the right decision. So I think that's a great one, the prioritization. And the third one, networking. Because you never know when you need to fall back on your network. That's something I didn't know how to do early in my career. And really, only in the last couple of years with LinkedIn and other things have I really started to build what I would call a, a real network. And it's been invaluable. You know what it is like. 13 different spreadsheets emailed out to 23 different budget holders. Multiple iterations, version control, errors, back and forth updates. You never really feel in control of the consolidation and collection process. Yep, I've been there. Stop, breathe. DataRails is the financial planning and analysis platform for Excel users. DataRails takes data from all of your company's disparate sources. No organization is too complex consolidating everything into one place, secured in the cloud. Now all your data finally talking to each other. Everything is automated back into your report in Excel. Cash flow, FX conversion, intercompany transactions, now automated and up to date. Drill down and variance analysis in seconds. Don't replace Excel, embrace Excel. Turn your Excel into a lean, mean FPNA machine. Find out more at www.datarails.com. So how would you recommend somebody go about improving those skills? I know you have a course you teach, but you know maybe that's one way people can learn. But just give a couple thoughts of if I'm someone who I know I need to focus on being a better listener or prioritization. I know I need to get better on the non-technical skills. What advice would you offer there? Yeah, well, I think it's actually quite difficult to to start. And I think that is part of the reason why a lot of people don't start because those technical tips, you know, it's quite, gives you that little dopamine hit. You can, you can understand it. You can try it out. You get that little um, kind of energy from learning a new skill. Whereas actually the soft skills is, is quite a lot harder. So as you mentioned, the, the courses, that's really the reason why I set up the, the courses because it's hard to learn how to kind of build rapport. It's hard to learn how to network as a finance person. So that, that's kind of the aim of the courses is to kind of tailor um, the soft skills to a finance person specifically. So hopefully lots of kind of real world examples of um, how I've used those skills and how you can use those skills. But I think otherwise, um, I'd say on like LinkedIn's a great resource as well. So um, yeah, by all means kind of follow me and, and, just we're getting into really good conversations about soft skills. And like I said, there aren't too many places where you can have specific conversations with finance people about soft skills. So I say, come and come and join in the conversation on LinkedIn. That's great. And then I'd say otherwise, um, probably the, 
the self-help books, um, you know, you generally find those in the nonfiction um, mm-hmm. section. Uh, there's a lot. Um, so I've been reading some things, um, attention and prioritization. There's a there's one called Digital Minimalism by Cal Newport. Um, and that's a great book. So it's really about kind of slimming down all of your um, activities that aren't really that worthwhile. And, and he, I mean, he's achieved so much in his life and it's about prioritization for him. Um, and also like Eat That Frog as well. Brian Tracy is, is a really good um a really good book to read on prioritization and there's various yeah rapport building books there's influencing books so i would say worth a, having a poke around um have a google typically these books are quite timeless so you'll see there aren't many books on influencing that really the cream rises to the top over time so mm-hmm. i think it's worth worth having a, a look around and then you'll you'll generally see the ones that are popular and then they'll they'll definitely be worth your time you know you'll learn a lot from those books no, that's great advice. And I appreciate the prioritization ones. There's a few there I hadn't heard of. But yeah, I have a, I have a few books on my shelf back here. I think Emotional Intelligence and some others that are, you know, some of those self-help books. And they definitely can be a good read. But, you know, the key is learning to implement some of them, which is usually the hard part. Yeah, I agree. And, and that's a great shout out, actually. The Is that the Daniel Goleman Emotional Intelligence one? I think it, uh, Travis Bradbury, Emotional Intelligence 2.0. Okay, so that, yeah, I've not read that one, but I've read um, Emotional Intelligence, um, Goldman. That's yeah, that, mm-hmm. again, that's a, a very well-known one, yep. and that covers so many different areas. So I'd, yeah, definitely recommend that one as well. Great, yeah, no, I've heard of that one. I know it's a good one. I think I've read a little bit of it, but for sure. So switching gears here just a little bit, I know you've been, you know, you've worked for the Economist nearly for nine years now. So how does kind of FP&A, maybe talk a little bit about FP&A at The Economist, like what functions fall under FP&A? How do you guys think about it there? Yeah, so it's definitely been a, a journey for us since I've I've been at The Economist. Um, so we started out and we really had quite a lot of hybrid roles. So you might have kind of a bit of accounting, bit of management accounting and um, a bit of FP&A. And, and mm-hmm. over the years, we've really kind of concentrated on more centers of excellence approach now. Um, so at FP&A, yeah, we've got um, a separate kind of accounting function, um, and then we've got a commercial finance stream. So that was the one that I kind of used to be in. So they're they're very close to the trading, close to the sales and marketing teams. Um, and then FPA, FP&A for us is, um, yeah, it's more about the budgeting, forecasting, kind of P&L ownership yep. um, side of things. So yeah, we're, um, and the reporting, we still do... Um, some business partnering but that's kind of it's more with kind of data teams or group finance or um sort of the tech team functions got it okay now that that makes sense that's what i always find interesting is you know every company structure is a little different even what just what fpna owns right what's part of finance how do you break it up between you know business partners and the different things so thanks for sharing a little bit about that so, yeah, and I, I'd also say, just sorry, Paul, just following on no, from please. that in, in terms of um, kind of the forward look for us, really. So I, I think the the one reason that's, well, one of the reasons that's kept me at The Economist for so long is that the finance and the business um, are really well integrated. Mm-hmm. So, you know, at, at times I've I've had to go to some um, a market, marketeer and say, oh, we need to cut your budget for next quarter by 20%, but, but here are the reasons why. And that's always been really well understood, and and, and that's sort of testament to the senior leadership at the company for kind of making sure that the message is is spread. But I found there's always a can-do attitude. You know, if we need to turn something around quickly, if we need to make a big positive or negative adjustment to mm-hmm. spend, well, how are we going to do that? And and everyone sort of mucks in, and that's great. Um, so yeah, really enjoy that side of things. And then I think the other relevant thing is our transformation project. So I think. Probably every company in the world is doing a finance transformation project at the moment, um, sort of a, a little bit precipitated by COVID there. And, and that's really interesting to me because, again, in the past, I think we would have seen that as quite a technical um, project. And there's no doubt there's a lot of a lot of technical things that we need to do, um, a lot of development um, and a lot of um, sort of quite intricate mapping um, and and uh, mapping of processes and mapping of p l that sort of thing. So definitely a technical side, but actually my role is is actually more about 
kind of the motivation and and the hearts and minds aspect of that because what I've found I think I think it's quite natural that we're quite scared of change as as humans that even if even if we think we're not I think we probably are um, and I think that again that's natural because we're risk averse as humans because again we're prehistoric beings and we'd rather um, survive than get a nice treat you know it, we, we we're very much uh, looking to to survive and pass on the genes and I think generally when if you come to people in a work setting and say, oh, we've got this new tool and it's going to be great and it's going to give us all these efficiencies, everyone around that table is thinking, am I going to get made redundant? <laughs> you know, so so I, I think that's a natural human reaction. And even if you're not thinking that, you're thinking, how is my role going to change and am I going to mm-hmm. enjoy it? So, so even with the, the technical um, implementations, it's really important to bring people along. So that's, that's I think, the, the soft skills element for me that's really fascinating um, in terms of bringing people with you. Um, but also the other side is, is the, some of those more technical roles, um, the entry level technical roles, they're not necessarily going to be there in, in not just in the economist, but in finance, you know, we, we've been talking about AI and um, automation for a long time now. And, and it seems like it, it's, it's coming, you know, it's, it's here ish um, only going to grow. So what we need to make sure is that if if roles are being um, kind of no longer required because of some of the transactional roles are no longer required because we've got this new tool, we need to make sure that we're training those people that are in those roles because you know we had the privilege of doing entry level roles um, and learning the trade and moving up, and and that's that process is going to be accelerated. So I think we just need to recognise that. People need some help with um, upskilling. And and again, I think typically that's soft skills. You know, we can't be a financial accountant for 50 years nowadays. You know, that things just move on more quickly than that. So, yeah, it's it's another interesting side, the training. So what skills are people going to need now and in five years? And let's start kind of getting them on, on those training programs, because as you said, the doing of soft skills is always the the challenging bit. Yeah, no, thank you a lot there. And I appreciate particularly talking about, you know, digital transformations and how technology is coming. Still communication is key. You know, we had someone on who spoke specifically Francesca Valley about uh, digital transformations. And one of the big things she mentioned is one of the key parts of any digital transformation and what's often missed is change management, right? As she said, change management, change management, change management, which you can sum up to communicate, 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 you know, influence and involve people. Mm. And, you know, those are all soft skills. None of those are technical skills of how do we set up the architecture? What tool do we use? What functions does it have? That all gets back to what you've been, you know, preaching as we've been talking is those soft skills. So I, I appreciate that. Definitely critical thing. So I'm curious, you know, you've been with The Economist uh, nine years now and I know a lot has changed in the last, you know, 20, 30 years since the advent of the internet in online news and magazines. So how have you seen, seen things change at The Economist? And how has FP&A, you know, helped the business manage through this, you know, kind of constantly changing environment of how we consume things today? Yeah, as you said, big changes really over my time. So, you know, The Economist, it's a uh, Got, got a great history um, mm-hmm. to, you know, to our, our printed edition. So 1843 was the first one. So, um, yeah, that's, yeah, it's incredible to work for a company <laughs> um, that, that has that storied history to it. Um, but really in my time, we've kind of moved away from print first. So, you know, we, we're a weekly newspaper and we were very print focused. And, and when I joined, it was really about kind of maximizing volumes of subscribers so you know, print advertising was was going really well and we've got you know quite quite a, a, a powerful kind of niche of of quite um influential high profile people so people were, were willing to pay a lot for the print advertising we know that's declined over time and digital mm-hmm. has um has grown but it's a little bit tricky to capture that digital revenue because you're up against silicon valley's finest and um and, and you know they're experts in in what they do so there's been a lot of um 
transitioning. So now we've got um, an app, which uh, so Espresso, which is um, has a daily component, so five kind of finishable stories every day, and there's a quiz on there, and there's there's some um, audio as well. So so that was a big change for us, uh, moving into something with a, a daily component. Um, and just generally the digital element. So all of our subscribers have a digital element now. Um, and, and it's really about building those products that can rival the best companies in the world. You know, we should, we need to support our world-class journalism with world-class mm -hmm. products um, and, and a world-class customer journey as well. So yeah, lots, um, lots gone on that we've done already. Um, kind of product and tech to, to get, um, uh, kind of make that shift as well. And we've done a, a big change on, on the back end. So we've migrated on to um, a, a new system as well to help us be a bit more nimble in the new world. And, and your question around sort of FP&A, what do we do? Well, I think what I've noticed is we just need to be a lot more um, nimble ourselves nowadays. So we're, you know, the demands on us are increasing every day. Mm -hmm. you know, we just need to be able to do things as quickly and as accurately as possible, you know, turn things around and, and allow the conversation. And then the conversation moves on and we need to reiterate as well. So I think a, a big change for me has been maybe more of our roles have been about um, budgeting and forecasting. It's been a little bit more fixed, you know, almost probably a bit too much finance led over time. And now we're much more kind of business led. We're much more agile in our approach. So it's really about being able to kind of run some scenarios and, and making sure our models are not too big, not too small, you know, but, but typically it's about giving people, they would rather have 80% of the answer today instead of a hundred percent of the answer in a week's time. So it's just finding that balance between um, something that you're confident enough in, but knowing the business well enough that you don't need to kind of check and recheck and then delay it by too long. What I took away there is really one of the biggest things is being more agile, being more flexible, which gets into sometimes technology, gets to, into having those good driver-based models, you know, gets into the soft skills as well of how you communicate that and, you know, understanding of risk tolerance, right? Because we all know finance people in general are risk adverse, like we talked about earlier. It tends to be in our nature. We tend to be kind of no people. And you know, we had uh, Christian Wittig, his episode was released today. And one of the biggest things he said is, Finance has to be willing to take risks. That was one of the pieces of advice he gave. And mm. your example of the 80%, is the 100% really going to be that much better in a week? Is it going to change the decision? And if the answer is probably not, then go ahead and be agile and get it out. If you're confident it could make a big difference, then maybe you need to wait. But you know, I agree with you there. A lot of uh, good advice on that front about being more agile, being more flexible in today's environment. So, you know, question here, you know, within subscriptions and with the, the economists, maybe what are some of the key metrics that you like to track? Are there any kind of unique metrics that you guys look at to help guide the business? Yeah, I think we've got some, some interesting ones. So being sort of mainly subscriptions-based business, um, as I mentioned earlier on, I think in, in the past, the ad revenue was so much of a bigger proportion mm -hmm. of, of our total revenue. And now that's sort of flipped. So actually the, the subscriptions, the cover price is um, where we make most of our revenue from. So we're now kind of, we move, we talked about moving from volume to value. Yep. So now we're looking for, so customer lifetime value. And this is quite a nice one actually, because it's, it's not that often that you can use your studies in your work. Um, you know, some of the more complicated things, but actually our customer lifetime value, it's um, a three year net present value. Um, calculation. So that's, um, yeah, it's quite nice to, to use some of those concepts and it's really about, yeah, making sure we're bringing, bringing on people that are likely to stay with us. You know, that's what sure. we want, that, that kind of longer term relationship, mm -hmm. um, with us. So yeah, lifetime value is a big one. And then also some, some more short term metrics. So the subscriber engagement is key. We talked about those digital products and one of the benefits of being more digital is you can tell how people are engaging with your product, what they like, what they don't like. With the print copy, it's always difficult. You have to do some customer research. Um, it's a lot, um, you know, can, can you remember exactly how much of a newspaper you read? You know, it, it's just not very exact. So as a, as a data, you know, data-driven person, it's great now. We can get really great data. Who's, 
who can we get to um, activate their espresso app, you know, and, and use that on a daily basis and build that daily habit um, and, mm-hmm. and build a stronger connection with the brand. So that's great. Um, so yeah, subscribing great it's subscriber engagement and that's our a lead indicator as well. So that if you if you're engaged more, you're more likely to renew your subscription, which is what we want. Um, and then I think another interesting one is is what we call the year one retention rate. So of the people that started a year ago, how many are still with us? And if we see that going too low, we're probably after the wrong people, or you know we need to kind of retarget. And if that's going too high, generally that's good, but there's also a point at which maybe we can we can reinvest some of that money and we can kind of spend spend some more on marketing and, and grow the business. So yeah, all these things are, are kind of in flux as we go, um, keeping an eye on those metrics, but they're, they're the sort of um, the key ones that we'll look at those three. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. A lot of your key kind of SaaS subscription type metrics, even though I get you're not a subscription as a service per se, like technology led, you're journalism and there's an advertising component, but still a subscription business. And I thought that was interesting when you mentioned uh, three-year uh, lifetime value to an NPV or customer lifetime value at three years. Yeah, I hadn't hadn't heard of a company doing it that way, but I could see where there's a lot of value in that. You're taking that time value money, so a very, a very good way to look at it. So thank you for sharing some of those metrics. I found that interesting. So now we're going to you know kind of shift gears here a little bit, and we're going to ask, this is a question we ask everybody. So you're going to get, there's a couple of those we like to ask everyone. So the first one is, what is something unique that you can share with us? Something we wouldn't find find out about you online. Okay, so so I'm I'm going to carry out this and and, and this (laughs) sentence will get less interesting the more that you dig into it. So if we just want to leave it where it is, then that's that's the pinnacle. Um, But I, so I have held a world record. I am really tempted to dig into that. But, you know, I'm going to leave it there just for fun because I have a feeling I'm going to tell people they can DM if they want to ask more questions on LinkedIn. So you might get a DM from me. All yeah, righty. That's great. <laughs> so move, moving on here, as you look back over your career, what accomplishment are you most proud of? So if you're in a job interview and someone says, hey, what's the, where are you most proud of in your career? What are you going to say and why? Yeah, I, I'll give you two, if I may, Paul, sure. and, and yeah. maybe depending on, on the interview. Um, the first one, and probably the truest answer to me is is seeing people develop um, in my team and, and hopefully being a part of that. So, um, yeah, we recently done, um, we've brought a few new people into the team and, and I just find it a really gratifying process. So, you know, we've all been on the other side of the interview table and it's the biggest thing in your week. You know, it might be the biggest thing in your year. It might be the chance you've been waiting for and haven't been able to get before. Um, so actually kind of bringing people in, spending some time with them, developing them, and then seeing them move on either internally or externally, you know, that's great. And, and I think I'm getting to the stage of my career now where, where I've managed a few people and, and still in contact with most of them, watching them progress. So, so the aim is that at some point in the future, I'm going to be interviewed by for a job by one of my previous direct reports and I'm going to say, right, it's payback time now. You need to, <laughs> uh, you need to give me this job for, for the coaching that I gave you earlier on. So that, that's a really genuine answer for me. And, and that, that's the thing that increasingly in my career, I, I get so much of a kick out of. Um, and then more on, on a project or task focused um, answer that I was, I was lucky enough, again, my manager gave me the opportunity to um, lead our last pricing strategy review. Um, that was about three years ago, and that was a really interesting project. It was massively cross-functional. Yeah, you know, it was it was the biggest thing that we did in that whole year, looking at all of our prices, all of our markets, um, trying to sort of standardise, making sure that you know we're offering value for money and and we're kind of maximising the shareholder value as well. So it was um, yeah, I think that was a kind of two or three month project. I was hosting all the meetings. I was talking to the C-suite. Um, really amazing opportunity. And, um, and again, that really, it led to, um, it was the biggest profit driver again in that year and the next year um, for the business. So when we talk about paying back your salary, I think getting that right um, w- was massive for me. And, and, and again, I'd say um, actually having the opportunity to do that 
was amazing. So that that's something that stayed with me with my team is is giving people the the chance to to step up um, because you you never really know what someone's capable of until you give them the opportunity. Um, so that's what I'm trying to to do more of. Maybe as you mentioned about taking risks is, is maybe pushing someone from your team up a little bit before you think they're ready and, and let, letting them have that room to grow. That, that's a great answer there. I appreciate both of those, the pricing, but in particularly the people. And I really liked how you talked about, you know, seeing people develop and being able to help them. And then the part about pushing people and you never know what they're, comp, what they're capable of till you really give them a chance to shine. And it's amazing what people will do that you never expected. I know I've seen it where like, I would have never expected that from that person. And they just, they amaze you in what they can do. So there's, there's so much to be said about having trust and building people up. So that's great. I'm not surprised you gave that answer with your focus on soft skills that, you know, that fits along that line. So I really, I appreciate that. And it's, you know, all consistent with who you are. And I think people will be you know lucky to get to learn more about you from this episode and you know, the courses and the content that you have out there. So thank you. This is another question we ask everyone, a little more technical this time, but it's one we have a little bit of fun with here. And it's what is your favorite Excel function? All right. So, so as you know, I'm not, I'm not the best at Excel. Um, so I'm, I'm not your X lookup guy <laughs> um, just yet. But so the function I like, uh, yeah, I like the most is some product. So it's actually one that I end up using quite a lot in in my career. And it's a little bit of an unusual one. So I think it just gives me the feeling of of being somebody. You know, I'm like, yeah, I'm I'm the person that knows Excel. So yeah, if you give me half a chance, I will be showing someone some product. And I don't know if, if people maybe um maybe it's worth explaining what it what it does. Um but for example, I might have um a list of products in a column um with a revenue per subscriber, and then I might have a percentage of volume. And what it will do is it will blend those two. It will, it will times the two columns together and then add up each individual row mm-hmm. and it will kind of um, blend it for you. So yeah, that's my, uh, that's as exotic as my Excel skills get, unfortunately. Some products are great formula. I appreciate that. So two things with that. First, I recently did an Excel training. And as we took the person through and we were customizing the course, the one formula that he specifically asked for and requested was some product. It's like, I want my team to learn this. So that's a great one to choose. And the second comes from Jordan Goldmeyer. He was, uh, I put some Excel jokes on LinkedIn the other day. And he said, uh, what does an analyst put in their hair? <laughs> some product. So there you go. The ding, nice. the dad joke of the day. <laughs> All right. I got a few, I got a few uh, courtesy laughs. So we're good. So last question here before we let you go, we've really, I've really enjoyed the time with you and I'm excited to be able to you know, share this episode with our audience and get them the opportunity to get to know you a little better. But if somebody was starting their career in fp a today, what's the one piece of advice you would offer them? Yeah, well, again, it's not, it's not too glamorous, but I'd say just two words, um, listen well. And I, I, really, I really think that if I'd have, had that advice, I would be way ahead of where I am now. You know, it's taken me a long time to get there. I think, as we talked about earlier on, just respect the fact that listening takes a lot of energy. You can't listen well all the time. I think you just need to tap into the times when you really need to be receptive. Um, and particularly with your manager, you know, sometimes different people are, are, are they give feedback in different ways. And I think what I've found my own journey as a manager and also um, from people that have managed me is sometimes it's a bit too subtle. So if your manager's starting to say some things and it seems a bit strange or you don't understand it, just try and clarify with them. Can you give me an example? Um, and it's a little bit what we talked about earlier on about saying back to people. And that's what you're brilliant at, Paul, by the way, with this podcast is was actually listening and repeating back. And it feels a little bit stilted when you start um, doing it. But actually imagine as a manager, you're having your one-to-one or you're, you're prioritizing with your one of your team and they say, okay, well, if I've if understood right, these are the three things that I need to work on first. You're just going to be thinking, yeah, great. We're, we're aligned. This person is listening to me. You're going to go far if you've got that attitude. That, that is great advice. And I, I would agree communication. And the first part of communication is listening. 
know, so many people think it's about giving the answer and how you say things, and those are all important. But if you don't listen first and really listen to understand, you, you're not gonna, you're, you're just gonna fall short of who you can be and what you can accomplish. So I really appreciate that advice. And I agree with you. I would encourage anyone, no matter where they're at a, in their career, to spend a little more time on listening and see how they can improve it. Cause we can all get better. I know I can. I'm sure my wife would say I can too. So yeah, I, I, I don't think we ever get to the end of the road with listening. You know, you're, you're never perfect at it. And um, yeah, I'm not sure if anyone's asked you this before, Paul, but yeah, what, what would be your, your answer to that same question? Yeah, no, that's, that's a great question. I think the one piece of advice I give listening would be right there. I think I'd go with communication in general, learning to communicate and primarily oral, but learning to present, learning to listen, becoming a better communicator is probably the number one thing I would, I would say to people. Yeah. Yeah. Really beneficial. And the thing that I like about that is it's so useful outside of work as well. And, and I think we know, we know we've got a good fit with work when we're learning skills in work that we can transfer out and we're learning skills out that we can transfer in. And um, yeah, if, if you're a good communicator, I'd rather be a good communicator than smart. I think you're, you're going to have a, a much more interesting and better life, I think. No, I, I agree. If I had to pick between one of the two, I would uh, definitely choose communication over just, you know, raw intelligence, right? Because conversations are one of the greatest joys in life being able to sit down and have those heart to heart and conversations with people, both professionally and personally. Mm. Right? We, some of our, some of our best friends will come from work relationships over the years. I know I've made some great relationships prof professionally to become personal relationships. So that's some great, great thought there. Well, we really enjoyed having you on the show today, Howard, and appreciated your time. We'll go ahead and let you go so you can enjoy your evening. I know it's nighttime over there for you over on your side of the pond. I'll go enjoy my afternoon, but thanks again for being on the show. I really appreciate it. Yeah, great. Thanks for having me, Paul. It's been really fun.